Hello, interconnected world, and welcome to the 17th episode of Tissues of the Day, a comedy show about queer culture and relationships. Today's episode is about phasers, torpedoes, shields, (laughs) zapping, aliens, you name it. You're probably thinking sci-fi, because we're talking sci-fi, but not just any sci-fi, sci-fi and relationships. So what is that all going to be about? We're going to find out. And we're joined Mm. by two amazing people today. Uh, We have a very special guest, Deb Brisson. Hello. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Of course. Thank you so much for joining us, Deb. Of course. I also have my amazing, immaculate, tall and Latino co-host, David, I'm I'm still here. I'm still kicking. <laughs> he didn't die. He managed to survive. Um, speaking of Deb, and speaking of not dying, Deb is working on not getting COVID and has been successful. Yay! Yay! That's her plug. Yeah, that's her before plug. every show. Not before every show, we ask the guests if they have anything to plug. Uh, um, I got my shot. Oh yeah! Right. yeah Can we it see it? Is that visible? That's it. That's it. Oh yeah, the Yay. sticker. That's my sticker. Or my so good. bandage. And uh, David's getting his soon. Deb has both of hers because the U.S. was way faster than us. A little <laughs> bit. Fully vaccinated. Very excited. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you can also follow Deb at Deb Brisson on Instagram if you would like. Um, are we ready to kick this thing off? Oh, yes. Yeah. Let's do yeah. it. I'm excited. Uh, all right. Let's let's teleport to our first section. <laughs> And wah, wah, that, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> thank you, Dave. That was brilliant. <laughs> uh, it was like a it was like a miniature person's teleporter. <laughs> shush, 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 shush. <laughs> um, we're gonna do some rapid fire questions, Deb, to get okay. to know you, learn Exciting. about you. So the idea is this: we will ask you uh, kind of like A or B type questions or very quick gut reaction questions. Okay. And just give us whatever's off the top of your head. Don't judge yourself. Don't think about it. And David and I will go back and forth. Make sense? Sounds good. Wonderful. Okay, David, kick it off. Sweet or savory? Sweet. Books or films? Films. Country or city? Ooh, city. What's a pet peeve? Uh, People who bite their nails in public. Mm. That's just crazy. (laughs) They do it on the train. Like, what are you doing? Oh, yuck. (laughs) Oh, that's intense. Mm. Um, Wow. What's your middle name? Lynn. (laughs) Last thing you ate? Uh, Echo waffle. Mm. Uh, What do you wish you could do more of? See people. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Cats For the honest dogs. answer, see people. That would be nice. Mm-hmm. Cats or dogs? Again. Oh, uh, yeah. uh, dogs. What's something that you're looking forward to? Other than seeing people, uh, I travel for the first time in June for work. So I'm nervous, but very excited to get on a plane and go somewhere that is not my house. Mm. Yes. Yes. I'm thrilled. What keeps you up at night currently? Um... My uh, first time homeowner, so money <laughs> does. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, oh, you don't have to answer, but vibrator or dildo? <laughs> <laughs> to be frank, neither. Oh, nice. <laughs> neither. <laughs> um, do you prefer to drive or to be a passenger? Drive. Always. And would you prefer to DJ a whole night or dance a whole night? Dance a whole night. Mm. Absolutely. Something that made you smile today. You guys. Oh, yeah. we're going to end it there. I love that. <laughs> I, know. Um, I know Deb more than David. David, mm-hmm. what yeah. would you interpolate from those answers? <clears throat> I believe Deb is sick and tired of being sick and tired. <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> Deb is so ready to travel, to, to see people, to do fun things. Yeah, That's yes. my guess. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something that I find it's so interesting about Deb because Deb is such a like, uh, like, I want to say worldly, but there's something more. It's almost like a whole person because the Uh thing is that she has this capacity to like shift gears as needed. So like she has been so dedicated to kind of like being at home, protecting herself, doing what's right and that. But like when she doesn't have to, she's doing exactly what she's talking about. She wants to see people. She wants to travel. So she's just like, she does what's necessary. And she's the most like 
I don't know, like, I guess sturdy would be a better word, but just, like, you can, like, throw anything at her and she will fucking knock it right back at you. Aw, I love that. Thank you both. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, you both are, are lovely, and uh, I'm thrilled to be here and to get to talk with you about <laughs> my favorite thing, which is science fiction. So, yes. 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 So that brings us to our next section uh, uh, that we're going to go into our thematic discussion questions. David, segue pot, give us a different sci-fi sound for this. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded like it sounded like some sort of like dystopian world where you're shooting off a machine gun. You know, yeah. like that's what I was. That's getting. that's what um that's what yakking in the future is going to sound like. <laughs> it sounded to me. It sounded like an alien you'd find at the Star Wars cantina, just in yeah. the background. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Amazing. Uh, all right. So what's special about this episode? Because we're all nerds at, here <laughs> present on the show and enjoy sci-fi so much. Um, we kind of like gave each other a responsibility. So we each assigned each other a thing that we had to do. So we had a show or a movie that was assigned. And what we picked was Her the Film. Uh, a particular episode of Star Trek Voyager being <laughs> Fairhaven from season six, episode 11. And The One, which is a series on Netflix right now, which is originally from Britain. And so we took it in. We watched it. We absorbed it. And we're going to talk about it. So number one, let's talk about her. What's the thoughts on that? I'm going to kick it off <sighs> to David first because he's the Ooh. most intimately involved. Yeah. Yeah, so I picked her because it's, uh, like I was saying off mic, it's just one of my absolute favorite movies. Um, it says so much about our relationship to technology, but also human relationships in general. And it says stuff about spirituality very vaguely. So mm -hmm. I guess to kick it off, my question to both of you is um, what character or what situation did you find most relatable in the movie? Hmm. For me, it was, uh, I'm forgetting the actress's name, but the female friend he has mm. who she and her husband yeah, split. Amy Adams character. Yes, thank mm. you. Uh, the fact that she uses her OS as a friend to get through a breakup. Um, I found that very relatable. I can anthropomorphize anything. So the idea of talking to your computer and having it talk back makes complete sense to me. <laughs> so yeah. that that I found most relatable and certainly something I would do. <laughs> potentially. Yeah. 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 For me, I really love that Deb brought up the anthropomorphizing aspect of it because I think I've learned to do that through childhood memories of mm -hmm. watching cartoons and sci-fi and things like that where, you know, the imagination of creators created a lot of anthropomorphized things such as computer operating systems, right, that would talk back mm -hmm. to you. And so a big thing for me was the relationship to the the, the machine, the woman, the her, um, because to me it was about outlets how like there are people out there in the world who are lonely or not they're with a partner or something mm -hmm. and yet they're still looking for more outlets they're looking for something that kind of understands them um because i think we're ultimately social creatures so even out in the far-flung future where mm -hmm. there's things like her and intelligent systems like that the need to have somebody who understands you to need to be connected and have an outlet for who you are is so vital mm -hmm. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I mean, mm. when I rewatched it this recent time, um, you know, I've really gone very up and down, very hot and cold with the character of Theodore, uh, Joaquin Phoenix's character, mm. because like he's he's a very flawed character and he doesn't mm. necessarily realize like how he's self-sabotaging in his relationships and he gets a little bit closer by the end. And so I've gone through periods of like, oh, I relate so heavily with uh, Joaquin Phoenix's character. And then I went through a period where I was like, well, is this movie problematic because it overly centers like this uh, insecure white male? And like, is it really not, you know, it, it, like, is it a bit of a wish fulfillment kind of thing? But I really think it's like, it's built. So I've come back around again, where I'm just like, <laughs> it's totally built to be critical of the like, just insecure white males and like um how uh they look for a situation like her sometimes and we were talking about this in the last episode of an overly idealized relationship a non-reciprocal relationship um and theodore really struggles with 
how then uh, Samantha is like accelerating and growing and changing as her own person. And he starts to get really, really scared that he's going to get left behind. And spoiler alert, he eventually does. Yeah. Um, mm. So I guess, you know, I could, yeah, right. <laughs> I, I could talk about this movie for <laughs> easily two hours, but like, um, I guess my other question to you folks is like, uh, how, how did it feel personally? Like, um watching theodore go through that breakup like how did you empathize with the characters going through that breakup mm. i mean i empathized with him certainly in the beginning everyone feels miserable um certainly he was getting divorced uh, i appreciated that he found a friend and someone in his os but yeah you could see as soon as she started to evolve um it all evolved and move away how insecure he actually was mm. and i lost a lot of empathy for him <laughs> at that mm. point um it's because that's what you're not you're not supposed to limit your partner right you're supposed to encourage and grow with your partner and he was not either willing or able in that situation to do that yeah so, that's yeah. actually a beautiful extension off of what i was originally pointing out is that even though we might have outlets and technologies mm -hmm. provided access to different ones and greater connection to people we never had access to before it really depends on how you use that right whether or not you're using that outlet as an opportunity to resolve and move forward and grow or if you're kind of like i don't know like spinning in circles right and you're mm -hmm. and you yeah like this in this relationship he's limiting this other individual this ai and um and it just all comes from a place of like you know just being flawed being self-conscious being confused being lost in that and just like you do we do need outlets, but we also need to move forward. We need to like step up and pick up and move forward. Mm -hmm. And if that's not happening, then chances are somebody in that duo is going to do it, right? Mm -hmm. And is going to move forward and move on. So in this case, it happened to be a hyper-intelligent computer system. <laughs> um, so I don't think we all have to face that, but we have to face our own version of that. And mm -hmm. what I found really interesting about it too is that I think it's a bit reflective of a lot of people in the current day. I think it's I'm going to say allegory, but man, allegory is the wrong word, but just it's reflective of there's a lot of people in the world who utilize technology and utilize be it AI or just somebody who's not physically present mm -hmm. as like a means of dealing with their own social isolation, social insecurity, social awkwardness, like an ability to connect with people and they use it as an outlet. And they'll use it as a way of connecting to the world because they struggle in some way, mm -hmm. but not all of them necessarily grow from it um mm -hmm. and there's a lot of people working in tech that i've met who have really struggled with, like social connection mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's so true and that really ends up being the point of the movie and the point of uh theodore's growth is by the very end he finally tries to write a vulnerable letter to his ex-wife and just mm -hmm. saying like you know you are my friend till the end i will always care about you and like i want to try to have something real and not like this quote unquote fantasy with a computer. I was mm -hmm. telling Robert about this uh, just as we were hanging out as friends, but a scene that I didn't register with me as much when I first watched it, but the more I watch it, the breakup scene mm -hmm. is like when um, Samantha is just like, we need to talk and they go to Theodore's bedroom and Theodore just like lies on his bed as they have the breakup talk. And Samantha says, I'm spooning you. And Theodore is just like, his face does not change. He does not like smile mm. or anything. And I think, you know, reading into it a bit, I think that's a moment where Theodore realizes like, this wasn't real. I don't feel comforted, even though this is a breakup. Like, you know, she's not really spooning me. Like, this was just something that I created. Mm -hmm. And like, um, and it's a really like, harsh harsh wake up call for him because then samantha goes on to talk about like she's established relationships with hundreds of yes. other people yeah. and like has really like expanded to an extreme like that humans could never mm -hmm. relate to and you know it's an extreme because like this is art and like it is an allegory like robert is saying like every relationship has this analogous of like the the partner really wants this one thing that they feel is like going to be really good for them and it scares the other person and you either grow through it or it becomes like non-negotiable, you know? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. 
I thought it was interesting. We saw his interaction with his coworkers and some other people in the movie, except his now ex-wife, how accepting mm-hmm. they were of the relationship, mm-hmm. meaning this must be some semblance of normal in future mm-hmm. society that people are dating their OS. I thought that was interesting. It gave me a little bit of like from a queer perspective of like, oh, accepting of alternative relationships or whatever mm. you want to call it uh, that I thought that was that was interesting and they treated it completely normal the only one who yeah. kind of panicked was his ex-wife and I want to pick up on that point because I think that is something that is reflective in the film and it's going to be a reality for our future is that I full-on think when AI bots become more mm, capable real you know, ca- almost like bordering on capable of relationships it's gonna be a thing human mm. rights and robot rights Mm -hmm. and humans having relationships with robots and that it's full on going to be a thing. And I'd love to hear what your thoughts on that are. Uh, I will try to keep an open mind (laughs) for me, I guess it's the only thing you can say to that. I think it would be different and I'm not sure it's a relationship I would engage in, Mm -hmm. but if that is how someone is happy and healthy in their life, then who am I to say no? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, to me, it always comes back to like the question of, well, are they hurting anybody? Mm-hmm. Uh, if they're not, then I'm not going to interfere, right. I right. suppose, because it's already happening. Like there is a subculture of people who yeah. have um, these like lifelike robot life-size mm-hmm. dolls. Um, or the body pillows from Japan. And yeah, or body pillows, you know, like... <sighs> People want connection and mm-hmm. they will try to come up with replacements for connection um, if the real thing is like too painful or scary for them. You yeah, know? I, I, just, I think it's oh. I totally agree with that. I think it's about mm-hmm. is somebody being hurt and is the other individual capable of consent? That's mm-hmm. like the two biggest things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know? I would hope people would still try for the sort of old fashioned type of connection, you know, yeah. person to actual person before going that route. But again, I can't dictate the way someone chooses to date but yeah. i would hope people would still want to try and and i don't think we'll ever like fully understand because i don't think that the the level of technological advancement is going to occur in our lifetimes i think it's going to be like 100 years out or something where it's going to really get to the point where it's like capable enough mm-hmm. and so it's just like i'm sure we'll kind of cross the bridge then but if we look into these sci-fi examples of the stuff that we've watched for the show and just in our lives I definitely see it like eventually getting to a point where it's going to be almost indistinguishable, right? It's like, unless you do the like, you know, Blade Runner thing and you have to cut the person to see if they have blood or oil or whatever is in them, you know, it's like it's going to get to a point where it's like so realistic that you're like, I think I'm talking mm. to a human. Yeah. 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 But wow. I totally agree. I think there's something that technology will never fully replicate that is human that I think mm-hmm. people will still default to wanting to be connected to another living organism. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's how we're biologically designed. I mean, that may mm-hmm. change uh, over centuries as we continue to evolve and include technology more in our lives. But yeah. as of right now, we're still designed to be pack animals. So Yeah. And yeah. once we mm-hmm. meet other living organisms that are capable of like are sentient, yeah. you know, like I totally see the Star Trek and Star Wars world where like we're going to have interspecies relationships. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. So I'm curious, David, what uh, is it about the movie that draws you to it so much? Um, I think it is just so simple uh and it creates such like a human conflict um like when you were saying before the uh friends of theodore who hear about this os relationship Mm -hmm. they don't really mine the like stigma of dating an os as a major plot point they just Mm -hmm. like let it go so that inevitably the only real like conflict in the movie is whether or not Theodore and um, Samantha stay together like can it be like a like a healthy relationship for the both of them Mm -hmm. and like ultimately it's not Um, and I think as well it it, like it portrays a lot of really interesting stuff about psychology and about like attachment styles um, and stuff like that which Mm -hmm. we'll probably do a show on at some point Um, oh yeah (laughs) and (laughs) the uh, yeah the character of Theodore and just like how much he really needs a relationship and wants to like disappear into a relationship um 
yeah, just like I just keep coming back to it. I'm like, I haven't quite found a movie that scratches that exact itch while also having this layer of like fantasy sci fi stuff mm. going on to it. And mm-hmm. it's just like beautiful. The music's nice, all of the aesthetic stuff. Yes, it's, be- cool. it's oh really well done. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. the, like yes. the game where he's like running with his hands. Like, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Well, thank yeah. you for sharing. I was curious. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm going to take us to our next. Uh, show that we went into unless there's any other points people want to bring up about her no. yeah happy to move on uh star trek voyager Fairhaven, season six episode 11 that was the one uh that we were assigned i rewatched it i watched it a long time ago but i had to rewatch it because mm-hmm. i forgot everything about it and the question i would have to you is that what were you? What did you think the through line of that episode was about? What were they trying to teach the audience? The question yeah. is, what were you thinking? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> for me, the through line was, and I can't remember what I thought when I originally watched it because I was in high school and I'm not in high school anymore. It was a long time ago. But for me, rewatching it as an adult is, I guess, is, is similar along the line of can you love something that is not flesh and blood? Mm. What is, what is that boundary? Um, Star Trek's version of it touches on sentience and not just an autonomy and not just, can you fall in love with an object or a computer program instead of uh, a flesh and blood character? So Mm. we, we learn, you know, Janeway struggles with it, our intrepid captain, but she kind of comes to the conclusion that she knows she's going to give it a try. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was my, takeaway from it of give it a try (laughs) yeah david (laughs) um gosh you know i mean i got it i did i don't know this series as well so i was seeing all these characters for the first time and putting some pieces together but like Mm -hmm. uh janeway definitely seemed like a really strong character i appreciate Mm -hmm. what they were going for as far as her need for control as a captain Mm -hmm. and her need for good boundaries with her crew like one of the um one of her shipmates, whatever crewmates Mm -hmm. is like, well, I understand your dilemma. Like, how are you going to date anybody? If you're the captain of this ship, like Mm -hmm. you can't like that just doesn't really work. Are you just going to have like one night stands with aliens or something? (laughs) Like he's, he makes some sort of joke about that. Yeah. Well, Uh, and literally like when you look at it from like an HR perspective, like yeah. you're gonna follow it like you can't have a relationship with somebody you report right. to and everyone mm-hmm. reports to her everyone she reports to her. can't date anyone on this yep. entire ship which is her entire population she has access to so and they have a to. 70 year journey ahead of them so yeah, yeah. yeah. i know she yeah, seven so, years though she's a badass <laughs> <laughs> so i think in that way it's uh it's a very cool exploration yeah like it could have easily been its own movie like mm-hmm. once it was finishing it was like oh is that is that all? And I know there's like a follow up episode where like some other shit happens in Fairhaven. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. Did you have any like questions or like stuff you were wondering how we read the episode, Deb? Yeah, um, I I know as an avid Star Trek fan, I have the full backstory on everything that was happening in that episode and on that ship, and I could give a whole podcast about it, <laughs> but I won't. Um, I guess my question to you then, so what we see Janeway do with her holographic boyfriend, essentially, is part of her dilemma is that she can control parts of him. She goes in and changes his appearance slightly. She makes him taller. She changes his stubble. She uh, increases his level of education. She changes his personality. So I guess my question to you is, if you had that ability to do that with a partner, would you? Mm. Mm-hmm. so let me let me kick this one off because uh it was my through line i agree with deb i think the biggest thing was overall is like can you have a relationship with that which is mm-hmm. not human flesh and blood but i re-watching it i felt like there was a secondary through line of like when we have control mm-hmm. over our partner and we have control over life to the extent of like being able to genetically because like we're, we're talking about eugenics mm-hmm. and things like that and the ability yeah. to have designer babies one day mm-hmm. um does it take away the um the passion or the heart or the the acceptance of flaw right you know where where we're suddenly when we have so much control does it ruin the genuineness of that relationship and i think that's what that episode really dealt with as well Mm -hmm. and i think we are starting to deal with too because let's tie this to modern day dating apps 
where mm-hmm. one of the big problems I have, and mm-hmm. I think a lot of people struggle with, is that you've got this catalog of individuals yeah. that if there's a flaw in one of them, you can move on to another. And mm-hmm. you don't have to put in the same level of effort. And you, you have like every description, right, from pictures to height to sex to interests to blah, 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 that you can just judge them upon and be like, you're not good enough. You're not good enough. Swipe, 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 swipe. So um, if I had that level of control, I, man, I, I would hope <laughs> that I wouldn't do it. That right. I would um, allow some sort of flaw that I, it's almost like you have one go around. Be like, okay, I can pick, you know, qualities I like in my first guy. You have like five options, and I maybe I forgot some, or maybe I deprioritized some. But I just hope that I would stop, or that mm-hmm. I wouldn't do it at all. I just accept whatever came at me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> David, what about you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was reminded of an excellent quote. I don't know if someone. If it's like a famous quote, but uh, there's this guy, Michael Bungay Stanier, I'm not sure if I'm saying his name right. He made a book about leadership and curiosity and how to ask great questions of the people that you lead to get, you know, to the bottom of uh, what their problems might be or like how to problem solve together. And he said, love is learning what to hold on to and what to let go of. And, Mm. you know, that is ultimately about control like what can we control what can't we control what can we accept not accept and yeah that's the fundamental question of like if you could have a holographic or you know designer boyfriend or whatever Mm -hmm. um would you go for that would you pay for it would you like how would that happen and i probably uh, i think there would be a honeymoon phase you know where i would just be like amazed at like this ability to you know just like create these like fantasies and stuff Mm -hmm. um but i think eventually i would get to the same place that janeway got to where she was like well if if it's not with a real person i will eventually like no longer relate to this person like will they age with me Mm -hmm. will they like will they ever feel like threatened by changes that I go through or will they just always be accepting and do I really want that do I want to just be like this one-sided thing this is my servant this is my sex slave like mm-hmm. really yeah. <laughs> um yeah well and yeah if, if so I would come to that question to control mm-hmm. them and perfect them will they yeah. return the favor and be accepting of your flaws mm-hmm. right will right. they like or are they going to be like it's kind of like going back to her a little bit of like mm-hmm. sorry right. I evolved past you bye right you know? <laughs> yeah so. exactly Hmm. Yeah. What do you think? I think I would, I would probably not custom design a partner. Um, I'd probably look up the info on the internet just out of curiosity, (laughs) just to Mm -hmm. check it out. Uh, No, I, I, I can't, to me, it would feel disingenuous. It would feel fake. Mm -hmm. Um, I can understand in her situation, in the character situation where everyone reports to her, there's no other option for that sort of companionship. In that situation, it might. Um, but it would feel temporary that that was not right. a permanent solution. That was a just for now option. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause then like, you know, I think we're also talking about the quote unquote, like biology, excuse me, biological imperative, like Deb mm-hmm. <laughs> referred to before, like us being pack animals, us, you know, many people, not everyone has a drive to create a family and mm-hmm. like you probably, you might not have that. With, and that's like even a whole other story. Like, <laughs> would you adopt children or would you like do some sort of surrogacy um, if you had a robot or holographic hologram mm. um, partner? And could you raise a family with them? How would you explain to your kids? Like all of these things. It's really interesting. I never even thought about that. That's <laughs> true. That's you, true. Well, this this uh, brings up something that was really interesting I learned about a while back. Huh. Have you ever heard about the theory as to why the gay gene exists and why it proliferated? Mm, mm-mm. Not you haven't heard this one? It's, sure, I mean, there's Robert. probably several. I mean, but this is, sure. this is one. But... So there's this theory that um, it was almost an evolutionary requirement that uh, for the most part, people have a genetic desire to partner with somebody who they were capable of breeding with so they could proliferate the human race. But the families that survived best were those that had queer 
family members who had a gay or lesbian person in the family because they didn't have a desire to procreate or they were attracted to those who couldn't. So they spent the majority of their energy taking care of the family. So the families who had somebody who was queer in the family could survive better because they were taking mm. care of the children or the parents or whatever. They, they, their energy wasn't dedicated purely to find a partner, make babies and proliferate. It was about, um, well, you know, like I have romantic attractions, but a lot more of my energy versus birthing uh, mm -hmm. or creating a, you know, somebody who's pregnant was the ability to take care of those in my own family. So the theory then became is that those families that had you know, queer genes in them, queer people that were produced, survive better, were stronger, survival the fittest. And that's what proliferated it forward to today. Cool. Interesting. Interesting. Neat. I mean, I feel that pretty hard as a woman who is not married. Uh, it is even if you're not queer, you're expected to take care of other family members, um, mm -hmm. especially children, in uh, whether or not they're yours. But uh, that's an it's an interesting that's an interesting idea. Right. It makes yeah. sense given my own family dynamic. <laughs> 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 yeah. I help my yeah. sister. Huh? Interesting. Yeah, and I think. This now borders into a very challenging thing about kind of the designer partner is mm -hmm. when we have the ability to identify genetically the gay gene and have the ability to take it out, the ethics mm -hmm. behind the ability to yeah. birth a child and saying, I want them to, to be queer or not. That blows my mind, but I think it's going to happen one day. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, you know, everyone's just in their RPG character creator mm -hmm. <laughs> trying to come up with what they think they want. Yeah. And like the, yeah, I think that also reveals something very deep about human nature is like, uh, you've probably both heard of like the hedonic treadmill. Um, the mm -hmm. idea that uh, it's this, oh, okay. It's this idea that um, when people live their life uh, in pursuit of money, in pursuit of objects, mm -hmm. um, and they like lust after objects and possessions and all these things, they, um, as they acquire them, it becomes a treadmill because their desire never necessarily goes away. Um, just getting the thing doesn't satisfy that like itch. They just like keep wanting and wanting and it just mm -hmm. becomes and a form of addiction and that's mm. why they call it the hedonic treadmill it's just this idea that like there's no um end to uh desire <laughs> and so uh <laughs> i think to there's addiction. an aspect <laughs> yeah 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 i think there's an aspect of designing a family it um that people might think that's what they want and then once they actually get it it would produce new problems it might not be good enough and then how do they handle their need for control or their need for things to be a certain way so hedonic as in like hedonism so it's like mm -hmm. that pursuit of pleasure uh, mm -hmm. okay yeah I yes, mean, that's yeah, what Janeway yeah. faced right Janeway faced like she's like she kept yeah. wanting to change things wasn't good mm -hmm. enough yeah yeah which is actually True to the character's personality, anyway. Very driven, mm. very um, won't stop until yeah. she gets what she wants. Yeah. yeah. So that makes sense. Oof. Okay. I'm going to bring us to our final one. The one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, on Netflix, the series that was from uh, probably the BBC, but definitely British series that came mm -hmm. over onto Netflix in North America and is about using uh, genetic coding to determine your perfect genetic match. Now, obviously, the series dives into it, and it's not as, like, cut and dry as they make it sound, and there's a little bit more nuance to it. But overall, the concept is that. Mm -hmm. um, this was the one that I put forward. I was curious to ask of all you, um, what is problematic that you saw in that series and in the human race when we have the ability to determine genetically like in the because like everything comes down to our genetics what is the problem with knowing that we exactly have one person that we have like the ability to match you to one other person in the billions um i mean for me it you know i struggled with the show a little bit i watched the three episodes um so I, I started getting a picture of like the genre that it's working in. It seems more like it's on the side of like political intrigue thriller genre than necessarily romance. Um, mm -hmm. And so what it seems like the show is exploring is more so 
the choice. Given the choice, would you choose to find your genetic match or would you avoid that option? And then the tension that comes from that, it I mean, maybe it gets into this later. It didn't seem like it was exploring as much the intricacies of uh, that actual relationship when you meet your genetic match. So it seems like the problems that come from that predicament is exactly what happens in the show. It calls into questions people's current relationships, their Mm -hmm. past relationships, um, whether, you know, if they have a family, they talk about there's this politician who's like, this is tearing apart families. All of these children whose uh, parents are going through divorces because Mm -hmm. of the question of the one, um, that's going to have serious social problems for us. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, how about you folks? That one doesn't add up as much as our gene says it's supposed to or what if that person dies right and yeah. that was that was what i was going to say is it, they are put the people who go through the program put so much stock in their one match is their one person and they're automatically in love and all problems are solved with dating um, but when you do that then yeah if that person dies do you do you date again do you just yeah. resign yourself that you're alone forever and no one will ever love you um, that sounds horrible. Yeah, <laughs> frankly. yeah. I, I, th- uh, I think there's the reason the title, the one it's right is in there. And I think there's something mm-hmm. problematic in that. Cause you know, like I think we've all probably experienced this in some way or another, cause we've all been in a relationship we've broken out of. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we are sold a lot on the idea of there being a one and how much we have to invest in that. A bit of that fantasy, a bit of that, uh, tale, that mm-hmm. uh, romantic tale. But, I have discovered that you can love multiple people. Yes. And and this definitely comes back to the whole thing of like, what can you hold on to in that love? And what are you willing to, you know, give up on? And not in a negative way, but just like relinquish mm-hmm. control of. Mm-hmm. What, are you, what are you willing to compromise on? Yeah, so much of the events in the, and I watched the whole first season, um, were just so harmful <laughs> to both mm-hmm. the person in the program and the people around them. And it just felt so destructive. And I would, it, cause it, on the surface, it sounds so tempting, right? Like you can put your DNA in the system and it will find your person and you're fine. Um, it's really just appeared so damaging. I think one of the points that the show was exploring was like, the idea that we have one genetic match, mm-hmm. you know, the, the premise of the show doesn't really work because it's called the one otherwise. But I, I think that we would have multiple genetic matches, um, so to speak. And so, yeah, just the idea of that, like crushing weight of losing your your perfect person um, probably wouldn't be as devastating, you know, yeah. mm-hmm. if that were real. But, you know, it's they need the drama. They need the tension yeah, in yeah, the show. Yeah. It's still creative writing. Um, yeah. I believe as a because I finished the whole series and I believe at one point they do reveal the fact that yeah. there's like there's a one, but there's like, you know, you're you're that's your hundred percent, but there's a ninety nine mm-hmm. and ninety seven and yeah. Yeah. So there nice. are the but, but they kept it, just, it as the one for marketing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And <laughs> yeah. and also there's also the fact of like um it, I think it also just comes down to the fact of it will put, poses the question of what happens when we can genetically determine everything in our life, mm-hmm. right? To the way that our partners are, who they are, what our babies are, you know, like, yeah. uh, you know, understand our full genetics and that, like there's good and some really dark stuff that comes out of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's that, you know, it keeps coming back to letting go. Like people who are obsessed with control think that if they have enough control, then things will be better. Um, and it's not true. <laughs> Uh, no it's absolutely not i mean the show doesn't delve into this like you said david it doesn't explore the relationships themselves too much um but maybe that's a season two subject for them if they get renewed to me though it's just because you can automatically fall in love with someone is that someone you want to be in love with there are plenty of people who are in very destructive relationships but are in love so it's still about the person and their character and how they treat you, um, how they treat your family that the show the show doesn't talk about, but I think would be interesting to explore. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that that touches on something great that my brother uh, recently said, Tove, friend of the pod. Um, <laughs> Ooh, he, the pod. he was like, there are plenty of thriving, loving relationships 
um, where the two people have very dramatic, difficult lives and mm -hmm. they can return to each other as each other's base. And then there are plenty of people who have very unhealthy, very toxic relationships and supposedly very thriving lives that are very like great and successful on the surface. Um, but that doesn't, that doesn't help them in their relationship. And they right. have this like fundamental weakness that like is still draining to them and like, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And so I don't know. I just think about that in terms of like what what's important to us, you know, mm -hmm. exactly. And, and you know, sometimes you come across those ones that almost like. Yeah, that it, it's almost like the elements are there that should make you work, but there is something in your lives that just like make it not work, you know, that kind mm -hmm. of like break it apart, even though like everything that is there and it all ultimately falls apart. And then, you know, you just kind of like find other outlets like food, you know? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gummies. <laughs> granola. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I love granola. <laughs> exactly. Wow. So, cool. Um, is there any other thoughts on that one? Otherwise, I thought I'd take us into our next little bit of fun. Do they, ex uh, this is a spoiler, spoiler mm. if people want to watch the one, mm -hmm. does the Spanish girl wake up from her coma? What happens to her? <gasps> Do you want me to say? So much. Yeah. Really? Okay, a lot happens. Mm. Yeah, yeah, please just, say. I don't think I'll watch the show. Oh my gosh. No, no, I'm it. not. It's not my thing. <laughs> she does. She does okay. wake up. Okay. Because she's like a pathological liar or something, isn't she? <laughs> um, kind or of. maybe not. Kind of. It's it, just like she's had a screwed up life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and it's uh, the lying is more a result of trying to compartmentalize, I think, and keep herself feeling safe. Um, it wasn't necessarily, so it does resolve that by the end of the season. Mm. Um, so she becomes much more of a sympathetic character and you root for her and you're happy for her. And then it changes so that her match, uh, the police officer, maybe she's not gr the best partner or that there's, there's stickiness to that situation is all I would yeah. say. Mm. Yeah. The, the, each character does get fairly fleshed out and mm -hmm. rounded out. Like you do find empathy even for like. Probably the worst character is the lead. <laughs> yeah, the lead well, woman she's in that, a horrible but, person. Like, she, yeah. is, she is horrible, but even her, like, you do realize that she, she's eventually doing it for, like, is kind of a flawed but noble reason. So God, I right. hated that reason, though. I hated, yeah. like, the whole series or the whole season is just, like, I'm doing this for love. And I kept wanting that other shoe to drop. And in some ways it did. But her motivation still was, I'm doing this for love. And I was like, yeah. God, honey, mm. like, learn to be okay on your own a little bit. Yeah. Like, yeah. So, yeah. You screwed very, up the world. Very anti-hero. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Or even like, uh, I don't know if this is a popular term, but like an anti villain where it's mm -hmm. like, you know, this is someone very, uh, very, very, very flawed. Mm -hmm. Um, but we're trying to understand them. Like just because we're watching them doesn't mean the show approves of what she's doing, right. but is there something interesting that we gain from exploring this like darkness, <laughs> you know? True. That said, I loved her wardrobe. I would wear all of those clothes. Oh yeah. Any day. Oh, yes. Gorgeous. Yes. <laughs> I want to wear those outfits. I know. They're beautiful. I, I know. David would color coordinate all of them with his microphone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have different I have different color pads that you will see in Do future really? episodes. <laughs> yeah. That's he also amazing. has different color pads for his shoulders. He puts them in the <laughs> yeah. Is there fringe? Do they have yeah. glitter? Okay. Uh, we'll see. I mean, I'm definitely changing the nail color soon. Nice. So yeah, just, you know, it's the little things for me. <laughs> well, true. speaking of fun, I'm going to call upon our sci-fi segue bot. <laughs> e <-yo. laughs> that was another canteen character. It was. <laughs> that was. That was exactly. Oh. And he had six eyes and a, like a tree mm -hmm. trunk nose or something. Yo, how's it going? Uh, just like, he's very weird, but he's friendly. <laughs> you guys. Friendly. Um, this Love is it. where we're getting to the fun of the show. We're doing uh, one of our faves called the audio cue. So we have, were all assigned to pick out two sound effects prior to coming onto the show. We uh, decided to go with a sci-fi theme. Did everyone go sci-fi? Is that mm -hmm. accurate? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. So two sci-fi related sound effects and we're going to present them to the others and then we're going to go back and forth between each other to see if one or the other can guess what it is and whoever gets it right wins. Yay. So that's how it plays. I'm um, excited. Who wants to kick us kick us off? He's going to do I'll it. I'll do it. David, go David. David. Okay. So sounds. Oh my god. 
gosh. Okay. What do we think? <laughs> I'm gonna. I, I want to do. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna go video game. Is it video mm-hmm. game related? No. Okay. It, Deb, do you have it a? It sounds question? like a spaceship engine to me. I just Close. don't know what ship. Definitely think spacey. Definitely okay. think spacey. Okay. Do you have another guess, Robert? Is it alien? Like the the, the verbals of an alien, like speaking. Not speaking, but it is alien. Yeah. Okay. Pretty famous aliens. <laughs> Pretty famous <laughs> aliens. <laughs> Pretty famous aliens. <laughs> okay, so we're thinking space and we're thinking aliens. Mm-hmm. Is it the background of the ship in Alien? <laughs> nope. Damn. Are One more guess, Robert, then we might move on. Small and furry aliens. No, they are the opposite of small and furry, <sighs> or very far from small and furry. Do you have one more guess, Deb? I don't. Those okay. are no. Okay, I'll what is it? I'll reveal I'll reveal at the very end. Uh, one of you Man. can go next. <laughs> okay, I can go next. I have go, my, Robert. Uh, did okay. you give me sharing ability? Yeah, it should work. Hmm. Mm. Do we know what it is? Okay, is it a famous? It is it, it a famous ship uh, blasting off or lifting off? Not blasting off, but it is a famous ship. Okay, Deb. I mean, it sounds like a ship in whatever you call it, like warp drive or hyperspace, or it's like something's Close. going. Close. It is definitely taking an action, but is not displacing itself. David, but, is it a ship? Opening the pod bay doors. No, I'm going to play it one more time. Thank you. So like a matter transporter? Uh, It is definitely involves matter. It is not displacing, though. It does not transport anything. Okay. Is it is it a recycling machine? Is it an incinerator? No, it is not. Ah, Deb. Ah, oh, I'm embarrassed. You're grinning like I should know this, and I you totally should know this. <laughs> no! It's from Star Trek. Um, it is from Star Trek. Oh, it sounds so. My last guess: if if it's not displacing any matter, is it creating matter? It's it, it's sort of. It's revealing matter. What? <laughs> is it the replicator? Uh, nope. Damn. But close. Close. Is it the? It's, it's not the transporter. Is it the revealer? Is it the matter revealer? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not a thing. I love your enthusiasm. It is decloaking of a Klingon oh. prey. Oh. Oh, damn it. Brutal. Okay, Deb, do you have your sound? Deb, I do. Oh, sharing. Man. All right. I might have to play this a couple times. I don't remember which sound it is. Ooh. Oh, I totally know. I figured. I, tr- <laughs> I, totally I, chose a lo- know. I chose the low-hanging fruit for you guys. Oh, <laughs> David, you go first. Let's see if you can. Is it go. opening a communicator or something like a like a captain's log? <laughs> kind of, yeah. <laughs> they just go <laughs> and they open it. Robert, it what is it? Activating the communicator. It's activating the, the communicator. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, wow, well that guessed. was a total guess for me. Um, <laughs> Cool. You're close, okay. Here, here yeah. is my here is my second sound, which I I really hope you folks get. Um, let's see. <laughs> okay, done. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> what is it? It's a transporter. <laughs> yeah. Yay! Um, from from which series? Ooh, oh, play actually, play it again. Yeah, play it again. Yeah. Let's see. Okay. Next generation. Yeah, next generation. Yeah, absolutely right. Cool. I wasn't sure if you'd be able to guess the series. The mm-hmm. the original one sounded really sh- like it was. It, just, it wasn't as <laughs> good. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, Voyagers was higher pitched, and well, I guess it could be Deep Space Nine. They sounded similar. They were and the next uh, gen. Uh, Discovery is crazy. It's like super hyper real. Like it's so cool. Like, it's like yeah, very different. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> All right, me. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. I'll let David try first. David first. Are they X wings taking off? Nope. Hmm. Uh, those Not are even. phasers. Yes. Yes, it is. Yes. Oh. Those are phaser shots, specifically disruptor phasers. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. What are the What are the levels of lethality for phasers? 
Well, Deb, do you remember how many different settings there are is on a uh, uh, phaser? Well, I guess it depends. Are you talking about phasers coming out of the ship or a handheld phaser? Handheld. handheld. Okay. Um, ooh, 10, I think? 10, yeah, there's 10, yeah. Uh, from what I remember, at least. And mm -hmm. um, I don't know if 10 necessarily... 10 was, like, kill, right? 10 was kill. But disruptors yeah. would actually, like, like um, de-atomize like, you. Like, you disintegrate would, like, you. Yeah, you yeah. just kind of evaporate. So yeah. they were what? legal weapons that only, mm -hmm. like... The Klingons and the Romulans yeah. used or something. Yeah, I think. and yeah. they looked a little mm. more like uh, like handheld. They were like a two hander yeah, weapon yeah. instead of just the point and shoot. Yeah, got it. Yeah. But they were wow. almost so, like always set to stun with the yeah. like Star Trek people. They're always like level yeah. two. Pew. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's make them go yeah, to sleep yeah. for five minutes, yeah. which is actually for... the ideal in a policing situation. You know. Yeah, uh, absolutely. There's actually conversations about moving to that in some way, moving to an energy weapon. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it only took like a thousand more years for a police force <laughs> to figure it out. You know. Like, <laughs> oh, good lord! Right. All right, I have one more for you. Because it's very easy. It's like I said, I picked the low hanging fruit because uh, I know this is not David's thing. Oh, <laughs> All right, what is that? David, what's your guess? My guess is a space dolphin. <laughs> oh my God. No, David. <laughs> what is it, Robert? That is red alert. That is red alert. Do you know from which show? Um, play it again. The original series, right? Next Gen. Oh, that's Next Gen. Mm -hmm. Oh, it sounded like the original series. Mm -hmm. It does yeah. a little. I think yeah. they, they kept some of the sound effects similar yeah, yeah, yeah. for continuity. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Cool. Oh, oh y'all were Here's, such big nerds. Yeah, right? Here's a <laughs> yeah, bit of sound one. trivia for Star Trek. Mm -hmm. I'm sure David probably won't know this, but who mm -hmm. was the voice of the computer from TNG? Next Generation. <laughs> it's no idea. I yeah, no. no clue. <laughs> So, if you watched any of it, Deb, reveal. Majel Roddenberry. Uh, mm -hmm. She was the wife of Gene Roddenberry, who created oh, yeah. Star Trek. And she was on the original series. Originally as number one, and then they changed the character to be Spock. And then uh, as Nurse Chapel. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And she mm -hmm. also became the mother of yes. uh, Counselor Troy and TNG. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And before Aww. she she passed, they recorded her voice and different phonetic sounds so they could continue to use her in the continued series. As a that's computer. really neat. Yeah. Cool. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Awesome. Now uh, we have the reveal of that last sound effect. Oh, yeah. It's a Dalek shield hum. <sighs> a which shield hum? Dalek, Dalek shield. Dalek from yeah. from Dalek. Doctor Who. Yeah, oh I'm not gosh. sure what era these sounds are from, and yeah. I wasn't sure like how much because some of them are very like some of them just sound very generic. I wasn't yeah. sure if the shield noise was going to be iconic. And they had a much um, more like mechanical and kind of almost I want to say steampunky theme. Yeah, they do. Them. Yeah. Oh my god, these uh, sounds. They're so much fun. <laughs> yeah, that's just Daleks moving around. That's all that, that is. Does, now that you say it, it sounds like a Dalek. Um, but no, I was so locked into spaceship. I did not think mechanical mm. creature. Or the yeah. sound effect so of the kid who's saying, what's up, motherfucker? <laughs> oh, shit. Can I pull it up? Uh, Please do. Give me one sec. Give me one really? sec. Are we going to do this? Yeah. Hang on. Yeah, hang we on. are. It's going to be amazing. So oh, my bored. gosh. <laughs> I love this Okay. So, much. so when I was looking for sounds... Uh, I was telling them off mic. I found a very silly one. Hang on. Uh, where is he? Hello. Hello, hello motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> what a choice. Yeah. What a choice. Yeah, there's so many. I, I will wow. not click all of them because I don't know what they sound like. <laughs> oh, God, amazing. Well... The thank internet. you for that. Uh, and thank you for joining us, Deb. Uh, we are coming to the end of our show. Ooh. Deb Brisson has been our guest. I have known her through improv. She mm -hmm. was in my hometown, is back in her hometown of Chicago, and I miss her. I miss and uh, do you have anything you want to take away from the conversations today? Uh, don't date robots, I guess. Is the Boom. You know, try really humans. Simple. Try humans or biological entities first before you dive into the technological solution would be mm. my takeaway. But enjoy watching it on television. It's yeah. good fun. Yeah. <laughs> David. It's okay to find people scary. It's okay mm -hmm. to find people intimidating or whatever. But 
at the end of the day, that's just the risk that we take, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> How yeah. about you, Robert? For me, it would be um, that loving someone is loving their flaws and their good mm-hmm. points. And that it is very good to learn how to relinquish control because you're going to enjoy life mm. more. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Deb. Uh, do you have anything you want to plug or somewhere people can follow you? Um, I, well, it has been a joy chatting with you two about my first love in life, which is science fiction. So uh, nothing to plug other than watch Star Trek Discovery. It's a great show. And it's very queer. Uh, I mm. cannot promote it enough. So please... Nice give it a go. Um, you can find me on Instagram at, at Deb Brisson or on my couch watching Star Trek. <laughs> Amazing. Well, <laughs> thank you for listening to Tissues of the Day. I've been Robert Mackay with my co-host David Day-y-day. Bohr. Yeah, that's the one. You can follow <laughs> I'm Day- just mumbling in the corner. Ignore me. <laughs> <laughs> just a little gremlin in the corner <laughs> in my life. Uh, follow David at BitButton on Twitter and Instagram or follow myself on Instagram at Robert F. Mackay. Um, and make sure to follow and subscribe to Bit Button and turn on those notifications so you make sure you get all the latest content. And go out there and stay wet, Internet. Yeah, stay wet. I'm that alien. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. And I love wet humans. <laughs> wet humans. <laughs>